Okay, so I'll start now. Okay, so we know each other by now. Okay, okay. So I am a theorist. So there will be lots of theory and some math. And I think Vishal has already told you many times that you the, the you know math is sometimes look like a monster thing and you're scared and all that, but it's something you have to get used to it. So you start with saying hello stranger and but you look at it again and again and again and someday it becomes a friend. So you have to practice, okay? And some of the maths is little, you know, you don't really need it for your work, that's fine. But some maths is very basic and that's something you have to learn. So you cannot say, oh, I don't need it or, you know, I forgot since 10th standard or something. You have to learn it, it's necessary, okay? So I will keep it at an elementary level. Sometimes I might go slightly high, but you know, please bear with me or ask me later, okay? So. I'll start with something very, very basic, first of all. So you have been hearing this a uh, whole week, I mean like three, four days. So first of all, anybody, non-biologist, what is evolution? What's your understanding of that? I want to hear from you. Take a mic, please. Change in L frequency, which comes out as a different phenotype over time. Mm -hmm. so okay. Suppose you are in uh, 1859. What would you say? Sorry, 18. Suppose you are in 1859. It's not 2019. It's 1859. <laughs> then what would you say? Something. Some uh, outlook changes over time. Outlook. I don't know. <laughs> oh, come on, guys. You've been here for this week, no? Okay, but I mean, it's roughly okay. No, no, I want to know non-biologists, non-experts, people who are here to learn something about evolution. Since we have been talking for the last few days, I just want to get an idea about where we are, what have we learned in this last few days. That's why I'm asking this. Anybody else? Non-biologists, who are they? Ah, take a mic, please. In case like if you go back into 1859 or something, mm. that time like it's about the phenotypic, phenotypic changes that we observe and that is how we define evolution like a new... Uh, is observing it? Uh, how is that evolution? You mean diversity? Is that what... A diversity, yeah. Uh, just because we are diverse doesn't mean... Uh, how is that evolution? Evolution is something... Just take the English word, no? From dictionary. Evolves. Evolve. What does it mean? The word evolve. Uh, okay, something that is newly. Uh, These changes, perhaps. Change. Changing over time, Changing right? Changing over time. Okay. Okay. Fine. So, okay. I see that some some idea people have. So, why did I bring in this number, 1859? This is one of my favorite numbers in the world. So, one thing I always say is because it's the name of a favorite pub. Darwin. Is it? Charles Darwin. Species. Charles Darwin, what? Origin of species uh, comes up in the thing. The book was published, right? So all of you know that. Okay, so what is his basic thesis? Let me just, so you have seen this like the end times in these lectures, but let me just repeat it because it's worth repeating. So the basic thesis is just this, that there is variability in the population. So these are the operative words which will keep coming again and again. Variation or variability in the population. Is this true for this population in this room? There is variability in this population? Yes, so this is obvious that there is variation in the population, okay? And this variation is heritable. That is, this variability can be passed on from the parent to the offspring, so that there is variation in the offspring population also. And if this variation is good for a particular environment, then those offspring are selected. So this is selection in the sense of more offspring, better survival, survival probability, and so on. Okay. So these are sort of three operative words, three important words which will keep coming in all the lectures that you'll be hearing. So at least you have to take these three words back home. Okay. So so this is a sort of uh, basic idea here uh, about evolution, and that's how you know basic thesis in that fat book is. Okay. So now let's come back to 2019. And what are the questions that people address? So some, some of the, them, again, you have heard in this week. 
but let me uh, say a few that at least interest me and others, lots of people in the world. So one question is about what's the mode of evolution? So these are some broad questions. So what is meant by that? So one is asking the questions like, uh, does evolution proceed in a way in which fitness jumps? So there's fitness of, the, uh, the, of, of a certain species, and suddenly it jumps and remains more or less constant, then again jumps. Or is it like changing gradually over time? What do you think? Has anybody, people have seen, right? Fitness is a function of time in many of these lectures. How do you think fitness changes with, with time? Is it a gradual evolution or people call punctuated evolution? What's your experience or what do you think? Punctuated? Huh? Gradual? Yeah, yeah. That's a, actually the safest thing to say. <laughs> right? So gradual, uh, punctuated, it depends. Depends upon the scales you're looking at, depends on things you're looking at, okay? So this is sort of a, like phenotype is what I was thinking, like speciation, for example, okay? A related question is about allele frequency. Somebody point, uh, mentioned allele frequencies already in this, uh, in this last 10 minutes. Allele frequencies, when evolu evolution is happening, do allele frequencies change a lot, or do they change a little, little, little to produce a large evolutionary change? What do you think? Sorry? Huh? So we are thinking of something like, you know, a long gene or big genome. There's a, this is important gene, this is important one, and so on. Allele frequencies, all these three genes, are they going to change little, little, and produce a large change? Therefore, in the phenotype, let's say, or will all of them change, uh, you know, big changes from very low frequency, like 0.1, and go to 0.9? It's not going to happen. Sorry? Huh? It can happen. Depends. Depends. OK, so allele frequencies could also change in both ways. And you will see this technical word, a slightly technical word in the uh, literature, so I'll mention this. So allele frequencies undergo subtle shifts, or they could undergo selective sweeps. So both are possible. And again, one thing, a research question that people worry about a lot is, when is which one possible? And if both are possible, what are the conditions, et cetera, when that happens, okay? What's the tempo of evolution? So I mean, you can add more things to this list. This is my little list, but you could add your questions to it. What is the tempo of evolution? That's one question that people try to understand. Is evolution a slow process? Fast process, or does this question make sense? What do you think? Is evolution a fast process or a slow process? Again, I want to ask the non-biologist first. Slow process. You're, you're not a biologist, are you? Oh, that's why. I think it's a slow process. What is this man? I said safe answer, so anybody is saying depends. Huh? It's a slow process. Slow process, right? Yeah, it depends organism and also scale of what? I mean, what is slow and what is fast? Yeah, so that's the first question I wanted to ask. When I said, does the question make sense? What is slow and what is fast? Is one hour, I mean, you know, it depends relative to something, right? Slow or fast relative to something, right? So you have to be careful about that question, about when one says it's strong or weak, slow, uh, slow or fast, it's relative to something. Just keep this in mind. I'll come to this little point later on again and again. Okay, so do keep this in mind. So, but here, for simplicity, I'll say, yeah, slow or fast when we say, it depends again. Both are possible, and some of them, some of you gave me example of microbial populations, for example. Some of these processes are very fast. Short answer is when there is strong selection, for example, yeah. What is the type? And the tempo is the 
as a function of time. Like it's a slower, fastest tempo. Speed of it. So, what's the speed of evolution? That's what I mean by tempo. So, in fact, tomorrow afternoon, I'll answer precisely this question. What's the speed of asexual evolution? Speed everyone knows? Non-biologists? Non, uh, non speed, everybody knows. What's speed? Definition of speed. What is it? This is the point time. Okay, that's good enough. Okay, so tomorrow we'll do that a bit. Okay. And another set of broad questions. Evolution of genetic systems. So these questions are saying that if I give you some, you know, uh, population with some properties, this is selection, this is the population size, this is migration, and this, that, hoo-ha, then how is it going to evolve, right? So what you are going to see, right? But why is the mutation rate this much? Why is this species deployed? Why is this, uh, this one has uh, this value of recombination? So in other words, why are things the way they are? So that broad category in which these questions come is called evolution of genetic system. So like uh, why this, the, you know, or how, uh, you know, population evolved from asexual to sexual, single cell to multicellular, mutation rates, recombination, you heard a bit about that from deeper stock yesterday. So these things can come in this category. Uh, evolution of sex, mutation rates, and so on. Okay? Okay, so that's enough of warm up. Let's get down to real business now. Okay? So, is this okay so far with everyone? Okay, so this one everybody knows by now. So I'm going to now really start a bit of math. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't quite get that. Why don't I just go with my understanding and let's uh, come back later. Shall we do that? Okay. 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 So first of all, again, uh, I'll just repeat what you have heard in the previous uh, talks. So, so the way I would tackle this problems is like a physicist would do. So physicists, what do you do? is to say, okay, these are the basic forces in a system. And then what I will do is, oh, it's very complicated, some graphene or some something. It has, uh, you know, all kinds of things. So what I will do is I want to understand this particular thing only. Okay. So I'll turn off all these 100 forces are there. I'll turn off all the 99 of them and just keep one of them and understand it th thoroughly. Similarly, I'll do a second one, third one, and so on. Then I'll turn on first and second, first and third, and so on. So that's the sort of philosophy. That's the sort of uh, you know uh, way I would approach these problems. And not just not because I'm a physicist, because population genetics has a very long tradition of mathematical modeling, and that's how things were done actually by the people that you hear about, Wright, Fisher, Haldane. So I'm just following that tradition. Okay. So what are these forces in uh, evolution? You all know the example answers to that. You again. What are the forces in evolution? Mm. Selection. Selection. Okay. Can you give it to that uh, person behind you? Mutation. What else? Uh, migration drift. Okay. Migration. So I'll call this population structure. So it includes migration, which means the population is spatially structured. It could be age structured, and so on. What else? Hmm? Yeah? What is drift? Let's call it properly, random genetic drift. Okay, okay, good. So these are the forces. And uh, in these lectures, I will basically not consider this at all. So Uma is covering most of it. So I'll just focus on first, second, and the fourth one. Okay, 
So, but to begin with, let's turn off all the forces. No, there's no selection, there's no mutation, uh, there is no migration, there is no drift. Okay, so I have this population which has these two types, A and B. Okay, and it's deployed, but there's no forces. All they do is to mate and produce kids and they produce kids and so on and so forth. So what happens in this population? The frequency of A's is some X. So let's say deploys. What happens as a function of time? Anything happens? No change? So I start with X naught, Y naught, Z naught. After one generation, Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're saying? Everybody agrees? Huh? Dissenters, where are you? No dissenters? Anybody disagrees? I think she disagrees, yeah. So I want to hear the voices which we haven't heard, okay? So I'm going to ask some of you uh, to answer some questions. It won't be exactly the same. So how there will be some change. Allele frequencies will be same, but not the genotype frequencies. It will not be same. Okay, they'll be different. Okay. So fine. X1, Y1, Z1. At t equal to 2, X2, Y2, Z2, and so on. Is that what you're saying? Because you said it's, it's going to change, right? Right? So what would change it? There's no selection, there's no mutation, there's no migration, there's no stochasticity. How is it changing then? Yeah? Yeah. So that's a clue. <laughs> Okay, so under random mating, what do you think? It, it, it will not change? So X naught, Y naught, Z naught will remain, X naught, Y naught, Z naught for all time to come. Yes? No. This is what is correct. So if you start with a population with these genotypes or with these frequencies, X naught, Y naught, Z naught, after one generation, they change, but after that, they remain the same. What is that called? Loudly. Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Hardy, who is Hardy? Laurel Hardy? Mathematician, yes. And Weinberg? Steve Weinberg, particle physicist. No? Okay. So we should find out. Okay. So, fine, this is our Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, but does anybody know why is this, you know, so you learned about the applications of this Hardy Weinberg equality. What is Hardy Weinberg equality? How much, what is the, uh, what, how do you test Hardy Weinberg equality? What's, what, when you say these frequencies are in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium? How are X1, Y1, Z1 related? Huh? There was some relationship, right? What is it? Huh? Addition? Okay. Okay, fine. Okay, so there is, okay, so that's one thing which I would like you to figure out and I'm going to ask you in the afternoon. What is the Hardy-Weinberg equation? Okay, please do look it up. I'm going to ask you. But let me step back a bit. So when you know, this is run in 1908, I think. Why did Hardy, you know, bother? He's a mathematician. He sort of, you know, wrote down this half-page half, half page paper in Nature or something, right? So there were all these people like Pearson and big statisticians and all, and they were making lots of mistakes, and then Hardy got fed up and said, ah, come on, I'll do this little calculation. And he did this little calculation. Weinberg also did. He was a gynecologist in Germany. He didn't get the due for a long time. 
and later on people figured out that he had contributed to it in the same year as Hardy, and therefore it's called Hardy and Weinberg. Okay, but why do you think Hardy did this? What's the motivation uh, when uh, this equation, you know, this little calculation was done, which tells you what happens to the allele frequencies or genotypic frequency under random mating and no evolutionary forces? I want you to know this because I want to motivate why we do modeling in the first place. Anybody? You should know, Chitran. Why? Why is there? Why did you do this calculation? What was going on at that time? You know the motivation for this? Everybody heard about blending inheritance? Okay. So blending inheritance was the accepted hypothesis for how inheritance works. The mechanism of inheritance. What is blending inheritance, please? Ah. So you'd say I am this much and my spouse is that much, so my daughter must be sort of middle, right? So it's sort of like a you know white paint and the red paint and you get a pink paint. So that's sort of the people thought how this is how the genetics works. That's how the heritability, heritage, uh, inheritance works, right? So that was the accepted hypothesis until the early 1900s, okay? Mendel's work was, re was lost. It was in 1867 or something. It was lost and it was rediscovered. But people still kept on believing blending inheritance while Mendel's laws, is that blending inheritance? What's the difference between blending inheritance and Mendel's laws? Tra not traits. The unit of inheritance is discrete. It's, it's particle-like. It's not a fluid. It's particle, right? This is something you have to know. Otherwise, it's very difficult to appreciate why we're doing what we are doing, right? Okay. So for a long time, people kept believing that you know it's still blending inheritance, and so on. But this calculation, which is very straightforward, is based on assuming that Mendel's laws are obeyed. Okay, and you get some answer. The problem was this. If you do, if you assume blending inheritance, you lose variation. You can think about it. You know, if you mix things, finally you get single color, right? But for evolution, what do you need? Variation. So evolution is happening, but there's no variation if I assume blending inheritance. So the key point that this Hardy Weinberg equilibrium with this calculation makes is that if you assume Mendel's laws, variability is preserved. There is variation, x1, y1, z1. The frequencies are unequal, They're not same. And it's preserved after just one generation. It does not change. That's a very important conceptual point. Okay? So this is going to be a running thread through my lectures. The reason we do mathematical modeling is because it takes us from these verbal models to something a little bit more concrete. Here, the idea is not so much about matching each point. You give me your experiment, and I'll give you my theory, and they sit on top of each other. Wow, wonderful. That's not the point here. The point is to make this kind of understand, to understand the basic concepts. And this is very important. It's saying how inheritance works. Okay, this is very, very fundamental thing. And this little calculation put it on a stronger footing. That Mendel's laws are the correct ones. Okay? Okay. So this is the thing that I'll be saying, saying in many lectures. Okay. Yeah. This is what you can show. Yeah. But there's no other force. It's just that, you know, this parent, it chooses this parent in a big pool of gametes and they mate. So therefore the frequency, if you just see this breaks apart and AA can mate with AA A and B can come together. So what's the change in frequency if you just write down? Assuming things are equally likely, that's what I mean by random mating, you will get this sort of answer. Okay? Okay. Yeah. No, this is a proof. This so proof. Okay. Because of mating. So I'll send you a little write up. Have a look. It's a very straightforward moronic calculation, but it's worth doing. And why don't you tell me tomorrow why it's changing? Okay. So, um, okay. Okay. So I just want to finish this bit. Because you see, uh, I just want to stress the fact that the reason I'm doing this modeling is because it has a conceptual value. And I like this little quote. So I'll just uh, tell you this. 
Um, so this is from this guy called Charles Babbage. Charles Babbage, everybody knows? So he uh, says, this is in 1830, he says something like this. In mathematical science, it happens that truths, which are at one period the most abstract and apparently the most remote from all useful applications, become in the next age the basis of profound physical inquiries. So this is just a dumb calculation, fine, you can do it, but this is very profound because we learned something very important about inheritance, right? And in the succeeding one, perhaps by problem simplification and reduction tables, furnish their ready and daily aid to the artist and the sailor. Basically what it means is, this you can use finally to test, for example, if the other force is present. So that's the sort of thing Uma stressed in her lectures. Right? So this, at that time, in 1908, it was just a little calculation, very abstract and everything, but nowadays you use it, but it takes time, okay? So when I'm writing this model, don't think, ah, it's just a model, it's not like that. It's, don't be dismissive about that, okay? It takes time, so please, you know, come to these things with an open mind and try to see how these problems are attacked. Okay, after this big philosophy about models, now I'm going to really do, I hope I have convinced you, so I'm going to really start now. Okay, so we'll start with selection. So all of you know selection, and there's been some confusion about discrete time and continuous time, so I'm going to work it out a little bit in detail, okay? And of course, any point, anybody has a question, just uh, take the mic and ask me. This is a very old calculation. On it. Nineteen fifteen. You see, these guys are writing models. They are biologists, like many of you. Okay. So the model is this. So we have just two types of, uh, you know, I'm considering haploid population and only selection, no drift, no mutation. There are two types, A1 and A2, and the frequencies are X1 and X2, and their fitnesses, these are the types, and I'm first writing the right in fitness. Let's call it F1 and F2 right now. And you would like to write an equation for how it's going to change only under selection. So you have seen this already. So why don't you guys tell me quickly? X1 and T plus one, how is it going to change? So I have a frequency of the A1 to be X1. It's fitness, which is interpreted as the number of offspring produced per generation. How, how much would it be in the next generation? Hmm? Okay. How are you defining the fitness of an allele? Fitness is normally of the phenotype that is seen. You can have phenotypic fitness and genotypic fitness. So if I have a phenotypic... Yeah, genotypic fitness is fine. If you're considering a diploid system, A1 <laughs> is, is not... Haploid? You're considering a haploid yeah. system with this kind of... Yeah. I can do diploid also, but it's more complicated. It's just more involved, so that's why. So, okay, I'll write it for you. So this is proportional to... You guys agree? Do you know of any example of a simple thing? Again, this is something you have seen. So you should be able to answer me quickly. In bacterial system, what happens? Sorry. It's a fraction of frequency. Okay. Does this make sense? So e, there are x1 frequency of one type. Each of them is going to have f1 offspring in the next generation, right? So the total number I'll get is 
F1 times that. But there is a funny symbol. That's a proportionality constant. There is something I'm missing here. So how do I fix that? Because the frequencies x1t, agree? Is this true at t plus 1 also? This relationship? Yeah. I mean, either you are a1 or a2. So your frequencies in the population must add up to 1. Therefore, if I add these two, so there's some constant sitting in the front. If I add this, here, I'll get 1. Right? And that's my constant here. Do you recognize the denominator? Anybody has an interpretation of this denominator? Average. First lecture we saw that, right? Right? Frequency of something times the value added over all possibilities. Right? So this is nothing but the average fitness. So let's call it by F bar. So this equation, does it, is it the same as what Vishu had introduced? He also introduced some discrete time equations. Is it the same or different? You wrote down some uh, sort of equations, right, in which there was, a, there, was no, there was no, there were infinite number of resources, so that you have an equation of this kind, right? Okay? And then I'm putting something in the denominator. What is this denominator doing? Is this equation same or different from what you guys wrote down? In vicious class. What is it like? R x into was it this? Is it same or different? Obviously different, right? Okay. Are they connected in some ways? Or are they all new equations? Connected? Okay. So tomorrow's tutorial, I'm going to ask this, how are they connected? Will you answer the question? Tomorrow, homework for you. Okay, so let's just make some points. If you look at this equation, this F1 here, F1 here, F2 here. If I divide by F1, I get this guy, right? So this equation tells me that the answer depends not only on the absolute fitness. There's something uh, uh, Deep already said. It's not the absolute fitness that matters. It's the relative fitness. I could have divided by F2 also. So whichever way you like. That is relative to a type. Okay? So that means are you better or worse than me? Or are you same as me? So it's not so much, so much about my fitness point. It doesn't mean anything. Is it more or less than you? So that's what this equation is also incorporating. Okay? Okay. So we have this equation. So let me therefore, since only relative fitness matters, let me call this one as 1 and this as 1 minus s. s is the number between 0 and 1 and in population genetics literature it's called selection coefficient. Let me just rewrite this. F1 is 1. Okay, so you can start with some x10 and x20, and you can put it in the computer or whatever you like. This equation, by the way, is exactly solvable. You don't need a computer for this, but let's not worry about it right now. Okay. So now you have also heard about equilibria. Can you tell me the equilibria of this, of this equation? How do you find the equilibrium of this allele frequency x1? What shall I do? 
X one. Yeah, very good. So equilibrium is it doesn't change. So X one T plus one is same as X one T. That's the meaning of equilibrium. So tell me very quickly, what is the equilibrium of this? You have seen this like hundred times by now. So you should be able to tell me like this. What is the equilibrium? What are the equilibrium in frequencies? Slightly different equation, but the answer is same as you know what. Is there one equilibrium value? Two, three, four, five. How many? Two. It's a quadratic equation. Okay. What are they? Hmm? Zero. Zero and one by s. Did I make a mistake? S. S is arbitrary. So this is what I got for any S. Is that true or not? For any S value. Yes? Have you seen this? This last two, three days. So what it's saying is that at long times, the frequency of A1 allele is going to be either zero or one. Okay, which one do you think it's going to be? Hmm? Which one? The fitness of A1 is one, fitness of A2 is one minus S, S being let's say 0.1. At very long times, I start with some frequency of x1 and x2 and change them according to this little equation. What do you think is going to happen at long times? x1 only 1? Anybody who disagrees? Very good. And this is the sort of thing you can show. We will not do that because already Vishu has uh, explained it to you. You can do, again, a linear stability analysis and you will see that this equilibria is the stable one. So this is something you've done already. Let me go a bit ahead. This was a discrete time equation. Okay, slightly different from what you have seen. In this problem, if you compare your notes from Vishu's class, does some question occur to you or is there chaos here? Any chaos, bifurcations? What do you think? I mean, it's sort of similar equation, right? Something is growing and so on. It's nonlinear. Do you think there's chaos? Why am I not spending time on it? Hmm? See, this is something I, I don't do it very well, which is whenever I learn something, I should connect to what I learned in the past. Okay, I'm not very good at it, but you guys are you know, much better than me. So please do that. It's very useful. So if you have learned something yesterday, we should see. Yesterday I learned something like this, and there was this funny behavior. Why isn't she talking about it? Okay, what do you think? While I erase the word. Okay, I leave you to think about it when you're having your lunch. Let me take, take you from here to continuous time equation quickly. This is a discrete. So I'm going to do the following. Let's take that equation, this one, minus x1t. Let's consider this object. When can I go from a discrete equation to a continuous equation? Let's just worry about that a little bit. So we have uh, this uh, one type with fitness one, and A2 has a fitness one minus S. If S is very large, like let's say 0.9, hmm? 
and uh, you know you started with some initial population of A1 and A2. After a small time, this one said, small time do you think the frequency would change a lot or little? So one has a fitness one, another one has a fitness 0.1. So this guy high up in the terms of fitness, and this is a fitness 0.1. And then I evolved this population, right? So in just a tiny, I mean tiny time, delta t, do you think frequencies would change a lot or little? A lot versus when I, the differences was small, right? Yeah. We just discussed that. We said that only relative fitness matters. So therefore, I can choose one of them to be one. No, S could be positive, negative. I've just chosen by, I mean, I've just chosen to be positive, but you can do the other way also. Yeah, because if I choose one minus S, if I had chosen one plus S, then it's different. I've chosen, this is the modeling, small modeling, which is saying I'm choosing it one minus S. The second one is the worst mutant. And therefore, because I want this fitness to be, the meaning of this fitness, what's the meaning of right in fitness? is the number of offspring produced, which has to be positive. Average number of offspring. I've chosen this, I've chosen the better one, I'm calling it as A1, and the worst one is this, that's all, that's my convention. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah what was I asking, yeah. So, if the difference was small, then the things will change slowly. They will be changing continuously. They won't be in jumps or something. Remember from the first class, the meaning of derivative was slope. So if I have a nice, slow, gradual function, I can replace the difference by the derivative. So when I go from discrete time to continuous time, I'm assuming that the selection coefficients are small. Okay? Is it clear? So you have seen already the discrete equations and continuous equations will not be give the same answers. But here I can do that and I'm saying that things will be okay so long as selection is not too strong. Does it make sense or not? Okay, then only I can replace them by a derivative. Then it's only a good approximation. Is it clear? Okay, then I just take this guy. Okay, could you just do it and tell me what do you get? If you replace it and put it here, what do you get? Um, can do it first, subtract it. Okay, I'll do it with you. Okay. Okay, I'll just give you the answer. So, because it's just a simple, because I'm assuming S to be small, that's when I can go from discrete to continuous time. You have to do a Taylor series to go from this step to this step. You learned about Taylor series already. Okay, so dx1 by dt is going like s times x1 into 1 minus x1. Is this familiar? Hmm? What is it? What is this equation called? Logistic equation. We are so bored of that equation now, right? So, but, so we'll do something new. I'm not sure if Fishu already did it. But I want you to plot the solution of this quickly. And I also want you to solve this equation because I need the solution of this equation. So I want you to solve this. Those who are feeling, oh my God, differential equation, please ask help from your uh, colleagues sitting nearby you who are experts in differential equations. So please chat with each other. I'll take two minutes and uh, you should give me the expression for it. I want you to plot it as well as give me the expression for the solution x1. So I'm starting with x1 0 and x2 0, 
okay and i want you to tell me what is x1t because i need it for the discussion how do you solve this differential equation this is something you have to do i know you have understanding of it and it's and so on but we need it start by plotting it given this initial condition okay let's do this following just plot it for me please how does it look how does it look anybody has an idea at t equal to 0 what's the value x10 right let's call it point 1 so therefore x20 would be 0.9 wonderful okay and you know frequency of fraction you cannot exceed 1 right so we have to plot uh, from 0 to 1 and t is 0 to you know whatever million years or whatever it is anybody volunteers raise your hand who can plot this huh? hey guys are experts yeah Can you plot it for me? Come to the board, come, come. You know, I've been talking, talking, and I talk a lot sometimes, and it tires me. So I would like your help, please. Come. It's OK. Come, we'll try it. We'll try it together. Come, I'll help you. Come. New chalk for you. It's OK, we'll start. We'll start, and then see. we'll see how it goes. So, plot, uh, so how does it look? Uh, if you plot x1 as a function of p, how do you think it's going to look? Just do from intuition, if you like. So you, so you guys told me that at very large times, it's going to be 1, which is correct. It just with the intuition, because it's a better one, right? So let's mark something there. At large times, what's the frequency going to be? <laughs> very large times. So let's say this is 1 million years. What's the frequency going to be? I'm coming to your desks, okay? So don't think only she is a bakra. So do it. Yeah, yeah. So now we have two points, and that's always a good starting point. So now we have to connect those points. Keep going, guys. Is a, so so is it going to go like this? You want to tell me? Is it going to go like this? Just plot it. Forget the solving. Let's just plot it. Okay, come. He knows. Come. Come, come, come. Everybody got it? Huh? How is this frequency going to go with time? Oh, not this? Why not? Okay. Uh, oh, X1 is the better one, right? Oh, X1 is 0.1. So X1 is going to 0. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, this, this is your curve, right? Okay, sorry, I missed it. Yeah, very good. Thanks. Okay, so something like this. Okay. Okay. This is something you cannot not forget, guys. Okay, you have to remember it, like till we die or something. Okay, so pretty quickly. So this one you say that, you know, at large times, it will go to 1. Right? So what is this large? Is it 1 million years? Or 10 million? Or 3 billion? <laughs> Depends on S. Let's say put some S, 0 0.01 if you like. Now I want x1 to be 1. When will it be? Any idea? Take whatever value you like. 
of s between 0 and 1. And s is small. Okay, so take some value and tell me, and the hint is the answer is independent of s. The time I'm asking was the time at which x1 will become exactly 1. Never. It's infinite. There's no drift or anything. Infinite population. But that's a good point. Yeah. But there's no population size right now. When is it going to become 1? Tell me. Look at that curve. It's right now here, I think 0.999. Right? Let's go ahead. Okay, 3. This is like log scale or something. Here, it's like 0 0.9999. 0 0.9999999. Right? So, when is it reaching? Exactly 1. Infinite time. Okay? It's going to become 1 at infinite time. Does that make sense? All of them, all of them will be becoming, uh, you know, at the same time at infinite time. Is that reasonable? Is that reasonable? Yes? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because I have infinite population. There's an infinite number of guys, you know, the whole universe is full of, full of them. So each of them to be selected will take infinite time. But, right. you know, infinite, there's nothing like infinite population, right? So, this simple equation fails in two ways. One is over here. It says I get x1 equal to 1 in infinite time, which is stupid. Okay. What about here? So, I get 0.1 frequency. Let me remove it. Let me make it even smaller. Let's say 0.01. Is this okay? 0 0.01. We'll start the same way and go there, right? Is this curve still okay if I had changed the initial frequency? Right? But there's a problem here as well. It's not going to just march up and on. It's not going to happen. When? When the population is of finite size. So this big thing that I'm missing here is the effect of random genetic drift. So if you just take logistic equation, it gives me a problematic answer, both at infinite times or large times, as well as short times. So let's examine each of them quickly. I'm saying quickly, but <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going very slowly. Okay, so this is the, you haven't worked out a differential equation. I'll give you the answer, and I'm hoping some of you will work it out. So I'll give you the answer here. So it turns out to be this. Okay, this is just a simple equation. You should just do it. So one way of fixing that part is to say that, look, I have only 1,000 individuals okay, in the population. So x1 could be 0. What's the next number that, uh, number that x1 can take? x1 is a fraction, remember? So what's the next value it can take? So next value it can take is 0 0.001. It cannot become 10 to the power minus 6 because there's an individual. It's a discrete number. So the fraction cannot fall below 1 by n. Okay? So therefore, one reasonable thing I can do, and it's useful, is to say that the time, you're asking me exactly 1, but I'm happy with being 1 minus 1 by n. So now I'm thinking of n individuals. I'm saying I'll ask for a time to reach not exactly 1, but 1 minus 1 by n. Okay? And if you do this little thing, you will see the time turns out to be of the order of log n divided by Yes. Let's just look at it a little while and see if it makes sense. Does it make intuitive sense? Yeah. I have a question about the minus 1 by n. Um, I mean, the next, uh, it is continuous, but at some time after it is 1 minus 1 by n, if the selection still acting, it will reach 1. It will reach 1, but I can't estimate it from this equation. Okay. I have to do a better job of it than set in something called Fokker Planck equation, this, that, hoo ha, which we won't do. 
So you're right, but for the simple thing, we'll just, this is enough. Okay, does this make sense? Yeah. One by n, because I'm saying the fraction, it can be one, and the next number is one minus one by n. If I insist on having one, it takes time infinity, right? So I'm saying that, okay, one minus one by n. If you don't like one by n, you can put two by n also. That's not a big deal. But the point here is because the fraction, it's of order one by n. That's what I'm trying to put here. Does it make sense? Log n, so log is complicated. It's not so easy to understand. But what it's saying is, if I have a larger population, time to reach fixation increases with n. Is that reasonable? Or is something funny going on here also? What do you think? Yeah? Right, because infinite population take infinite time. But 10 guys will take shorter, 100 will take longer, and so on, right? And it's inversely proportional to s. s is small, 0 0.01. It takes some time. But if I, s, I made the selection coefficient to be 0 0.02, it's taking shorter time. Is that reasonable? Make sense? OK. So this is one very classic result, very simple from this little deterministic, meaning we haven't put really full-fledged drift, but this is some simple thing which I will need tomorrow as well. So please don't forget. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what about the uh, yeah, so that's there over here. Uh, right, but yeah, so there is some pre-factor. Yeah, we're not worrying about that. Okay? Yeah? So this is a simple thing that you learn from a drift that you cannot have infinite time because it's realistic population are finite. So you should take finite time. And there's a non-trivial, simple answer. It takes a time of the order of log n divided by s. Okay, so let's worry about this part now. So I'm going to change the model a bit. Is this okay? Discrete, continuous. Multi oh, okay. By the way, yeah, this. Uh, yeah, so this is log of one minus s now, okay? Or log of one by one minus s. So that's what it comes s. This is a this is the Malthusian fitness. Okay. So let me just go over to drift. I'm going to do a new kind of calculation, which I think most of you have not seen it. So I'll just go slowly. Even if it, it's not something you might not use it in your entire career, but you know, in the realm of ideas, what people try, how do other people think differently about questions, right? So at least try to get that much out. Okay, and secondly, does the answer make sense or not? Again, what I'm going to do is a very classic calculation, again, very old, 1930s or so. So we are like old guys. So the reason I'm doing this old stuff is because tomorrow I'll show you some new stuff where I'll use these old results and show you how you can build upon these little, little results, okay? Okay, so to address this part, let me ask you like this. Let's think of bacteria, okay? The sexual population. I start with a single particle. Or <laughs> this persist always a particle. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't. I'll come to that. So we don't always go linearly like this model. I have to totally understand it. So, you know, we'll do it slightly differently. Something else I'll set it up and it will help me to understand that part. I'll come to that. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to address. Yeah. Any other question? No. Okay, so let's ask slightly differently and we'll come back to that point at what, what happens at short times. So I have this one individual bacteria. What does it do in the next generation? What can it do? Divide. Is that all it can do? What else can happen? It can die. Right? Okay. Okay. So let's say this bacteria, it produces zero offspring 
with a probability f0 and two offspring with a probability f2. So this happens with probability f2 and this happens with probability f0. Any relationship between f2 and f0? Okay, so let's continue this a little bit more. So this happens with F2, F0 and F2, right? So suppose I do this. It happens at t equal to 2. What can happen? Hmm? You have to say it loudly. I haven't heard you say much, so I would like to hear you. Both who? of them. Who can die? There are two guys now. Yeah. I, either one of them can die or both of them can die. Yeah. And uh, they can both divide and either one of them. Yeah. So how many possibilities we got? Four. No. Four. So both can reproduce and, uh, and do this. Right? Live on? I'm saying there's some probability that it happens. If F0 is 0, yeah, you're right. But in general, there is some, you know, um, probability of that. Yeah, they're always dividing, then they'll live forever. That's not really interesting, right? Let them die. So, okay, I'll say the motivation for this. Motivation is that I have a large population of a type, let's say this class, and this uh, little pop star comes into it, which is a rare mutant, okay? So will he or she spread in the sense her, her habits, will all of you come with spiky hair tomorrow, right? So that's the question about spreading or invasion of a rare mutant, okay? So what I'm trying to do is to calculate what's the chance of doing that. And it's a very important calculation, very important result. That's what I'm trying to do. And if I put F0 equal to 0, uh, you know, this one will live. This It's guaranteed. Hmm? And the relation, because time is short, so I'll come to that calculation a little later. Let me just finish the story part. What happens is, when you have very short times, the population of X1, even if it's beneficial, even if it's good, there's no guarantee in a finite population that it will spread. So in this class, when this pop star comes, maybe one or two will have spiky hair tomorrow, but then maybe you'll change your mind, and then you know that mutant did not spread. Okay? So there's a chance of that. The chance is what we calculate all the time when we want to calculate, when we want to take random genetic drift into account. And it has a name, it's called fixation probability. Okay? So that's a key thing. If we have learned that much, we we are in a good shape. So let me just write it. So this is not okay. Let me correct this part. So what will happen actually is that this guy will start here. And because of stochastic process, it might increase, its frequency might increase, and it might die out, even though it's a better one. That's what drift does. That's the meaning of stochasticity. Okay, so think of something, you know, like some new airline has been floated or something. Does, uh, do all these new airlines come with the great innovative ideas and all that? Do they all take up the market? No, right? So it's not just about being good. It's also about being lucky. So if you like, you can think it that way. So this is the unlucky guy. Although it was better. And in, then you repeat this process, you again introduce this mutant, and then it might happen, it in increases. Oops. Right? So when you're saying it's better, frequency only one, no, sir. In realistic the populations, that will not happen. 
There's only a finite chance, a less than one probability for that to happen. Okay? Okay? So, okay, since we have four minutes only, I'll see if we want to do the calculation later on. I'll give you an answer, and in three minutes, I want you to plot it for me. So we'll come to that later. So this is the classic result due to this guy called Kimura, which says if I have a rare mutant with a selective advantage or disadvantage or a selection coefficient s, then the chance it fixes in a population of size n is given by this complicated expression. How many of you have seen this formula? Anybody have seen? Except uh, Archana and uh, Sachin. Have you seen this? Wonderful. Nobody has seen this? Come on. How can you not know this? This is the something which we keep invoking all the time. When you're talking about mutations in accumulation experiments, and you're saying single bottlenecks, we explained to you yesterday. This is what we have in mind. OK? This calculation I was going to do, it's, this is it's also contained in this big formula. So why don't we do the following? Why don't you just quickly plot this as a function of s, fix the value of n, plot as a function of s, s could be positive, negative, or 0. And show me how pi looks like as a function of s. Come, let's start. s is a small number. Let's say between minus 0.1 to 0.1. N is 100, let's say. Please plot it for me. Suppose S is positive. Let's think about that case. Right? So this mutant, so the population has a fitness 1, and the mutant has a fitness 1 plus S. S is positive. Hmm? So it's a better one. And I'm saying the, in a finite population of size n, the chance it will spread is given by that formula. How does it look? What's your, your intuition? What do you think? It will increase, decrease, go up and down. How does it look with s? Positive s. Increase? Decrease? Or positive s? Justin Timberlake comes here, all of you will become like him, no? He has much more advantage than you, no? Oh, come on. With S positive, what do you think it will look like? Increase? Make sense? Okay, let's uh, take that and go towards 1 is a probability, so it cannot. Roughly. Okay, this is not really correct. Yeah, S negative. Use the open your computers. You can plot using computers. It's fine. That's all you are waiting for to get a permission. <laughs> no, on the negative side, it will decrease when S is negative. Yeah, because you know, I'm a bad guy. I am, uh, I don't know, somebody. Okay, and uh, if I come in the class, it's highly unlikely you guys will not imitate that person, right? Yeah, but some might. So there's a small chance that the deleterious mutation might get fixed. But that small chance is really small. How small? Anybody wants to quanti make the quantification of that? How small is that chance? Use a formula. How small is that chance? So you expect it to be small. It's not like this like large thing, right? How small? It's exponentially small. How should I plot it? Anybody wants to plot? You have plots, no? Look at it and tell me how it looks. Mm. Uh, come, come and show. Plot the whole thing. Negative, positive, zero, everything. Negative, positive, zero. Yeah, because you saw the answer. <laughs> uh, 
Ooh. So you're saying, if I'm really, really bad, all of you will imitate me? Uh, no, this is, this is negative, but S can't be... Uh, no, S can be negative, that's fine. Are we taking so S, S is negative? So this is? population is a fitness 1. Right. And my fitness is 1 minus S. Right. So I'm much worse than you. Right. So you're saying this is chance, this is definitely all of you will imitate me. I'm so bad. Uh, no, I mean, I guess this would be when S is, um, when S is between... Uh, and one. So, no, this part I'm saying. People, it's negative. Does this make sense to you? Or to me? Huh? Hmm, come, come. Come fast. And the maths types, tell me what happens when S is close to zero. And they're fine. No, no, do properly. <laughs> What's the chance when S is very tiny? And that's very important. Huh? It's going increasing. When S is negative, yeah. Is but is it increasing like that? Is it no, increasing? No, no, it should be. It's by one. Yeah, but that's not what you're showing me. Flat. Yeah, flat, but flat means it becomes constant. So no matter how bad I am, is this some chance? Don't look at his, what he is doing. He's not doing it correctly. So you should try it yourself. Try, try. How does it look for S negative? Come. Let it try. What's time? Time, time, time. Just tell me for four minutes. <laughs> uh huh. Very nice. But what's happening over there? It's going up. Yeah. And then here yeah. it goes up. No, but you're doing it right. It keeps going down. So this is guy very good, wonderful. So when S is positive. If the mutant is much better, there's a higher chance of it to spread in the population. Makes intuitive sense? One sec. Whereas if it is much worse, there's a very low chance, exponentially small chance, e to the power minus 2 and s chance of it to spread. But it can spread. Okay? So when we are saying about mutation accumulation experiments, we are thinking of something like this. So that something requires a little bit more work. Could you guys tell me what happens when S is tiny? Close to zero. Yeah, you had a question. S is zero. So you're saying neutral mutants don't spread. That's not true. So what happens when S equal to zero? Let's do a little math. S equal to zero, how much is this? Numerator? No, numerator. Uparwala. Zero. Denominator? Zero. Zero? Oops. What the hell is this? Zero by zero. Now you wish you had learned about limits. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll give you the answer. Okay? So for S going to zero, you have to do something called, oh no, actually you can use Taylor series expansion. Just do a Taylor series of the denominator. Okay? And I promise you will get this answer. This is not 0. This is 1 by n. So the probability of fixing, three minutes, probability of fixing a neutral mutant is 1 by n. Again, I'll be using this result and I'll tell you about it using coalescent theory. Okay? I'll come to that later on. Okay? So this is probability is 1 by n. It's exponentially small and increases for positive s. When we are thinking of less mutation accumulation experiments, the following happens. The, this, this, the probability is almost 1 by n, okay? In a region where n times s is much, much less than 1. So it's not that s has to be exactly 0. 
if s is smaller than 1 by n, okay, the modulus of it, then the fixation probability is close to 1 by n, which is like the neutral limit. So this is the, when it's a neutral, it doesn't mean s is exactly zero, we can't measure those kind of things. But if it's like 1 by n, okay, then the things are really neutral. So what this says is, if the population size is small, right, then the things in this region would be nearly neutral. And that's the sort of idea behind having this small, uh, you know, uh, bottlenecks of small size. So S will be small if N is, okay? Let me just finish one more point. <laughs> Sorry. So this is when NS is smaller than one, and if NS is larger than one, then you have selection. If N is large, how large? Larger than one by S, you have selection. If N is small, how small? Relative to one by S, then you are almost neutral. And that's why we would like to take these bottlenecks with single cells and so on. That's roughly the idea behind mutation accumulation experiments, at least as far as I understand. Okay? Second point. We will be doing all these things, and I think in uh, Uma's class you heard that. We don't measure, there was a, uh, this combination of factors coming, n times n, m. Anybody remembers what is this? n times m, migration rate m times n. And she said, people say, oh, measure migration rate, we can't do that, right? Because these theories are such that they give you this composite parameter. They don't tell you. S separately, N separately. Things come out in this composite parameter combination. N times S, N times M, N times mu, mu is the mutation. So that's a recurring thing that we'll see all the time in many of these theories, okay? So this is the composite parameter, and what's the use of that? That I already said. When you say selection is strong, you have to say strong relative to what? That's what I said in the beginning. When you say something fast or small or strong or weak, relative to something. Right? So when you're saying selection is strong, we mean, it depends on the context, but here we mean relative to the drift. The drift parameter is 1 by n. Selection is strong when s is larger than 1 by n. Selection is weak when s is less than 1 by n. That's what we mean. Is that okay? So I think it's a lot of uh, conceptual things that I have told you, and you have to think about it. And if it's not clear, ask me again, or you know, mull over it over the next Two days, or you know, until we do the advanced school next year. So maybe I should just stop here so that you can get some energy. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you.